PH235. And we have Troy Colby as our guest artist today. And um, oh my goodness, I feel like I've known Troy's work for years. And, uh, but I wanted to share a couple things here. Um, oh, let's see. Does this show you a picture of a wall that says Academy of Art University? So this is Troy's exhibition, and he had this last year. And to be honest, it feels like he he had it like like 15 years ago. <laughs> you know what I mean? The idea, like, and what I mean by that is not so much commenting on our times, but his work is so timeless, and it feels like something that you have seen in your past, or something you grew up with, or something that you can relate to from your own family. And seeing his show here which was in our gallery at 625 Sutter last year. Oh, it had the sense of familiar, but it also had the sense of just something very, very refreshing. And, you know, I have been a friend of, uh, you know, Facebooky type of way of, of Troy for a while. And when he came here for this exhibition, we got to hang out a little bit. Um, and, you know, the, the thing that struck me when he was telling me where he came from was, he was saying how he was an appliance repairman um, living in Kansas. And for some reason that really stuck with me. And it doesn't seem to mean anything to Troy himself, but this idea, and I guess maybe my vision of what an appliance repairman does, but this idea that it would be, um, oh, you're in people's homes, you're seeing pieces of their life, you're seeing their kind of stories and then leaving as you do your task. It kind of paralleled certain things I myself experienced as a working photographer and even the way I like to photograph my own family. And so keep that in mind as we look at his work. And I think it also reminded me of how democratic photography could be. Like, you know, there's an idea that maybe photography is an elite thing and the idea is anybody can be turned on by photography and follow a truly original path. And I, I think Troy is someone who did that. Um, a picture of his that, uh, Lord, I don't know when he made this, but this stuck in my brain this fall. And I remember he posted this to Facebook, to Instagram, and I was like, yeah, who among us has not dressed someone up like a mean clown and posed a child in their hands, making us question whether the child is dead or alive? Um, I meant that as a joke at the time, but it was just that the idea that these were the pictures he was making um, showed that he just had a very strong vision for what he wanted to do. Um, and so with that, I will turn this over to um, Troy Colby. Thank you, Troy. Yeah. Um, it's not letting me share my screen. Yeah. There we go. And you know what I would say as Troy's getting this ready, what's worked well in the past is as questions come up for everyone, put them in the chat. And then that'll allow you to respond as you're seeing things. And then we'll read them later and we'll propose them to Troy. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. All right. Well, thanks for having me come speak about my work. And thanks, Timothy, for reaching out. Um, it was kind of unexpected, as all things are in life. And thanks to AAU for having me back. Um, I really enjoyed my time at AAU and I hope, I'm glad to be helping other photographers and I hope you guys enjoy it as well. So I'm gonna kind of dive into my project, The Fragility of Fatherhood. Um, it's the most recent project and it's kind of my most poignant project. Um, and then after that, I'm gonna start, and it's interesting Timothy brings it up. I'm gonna start way back way what kind of how I got into photography and how it all leads up to where I am now. Um, it took me a lot of years to kind of realize like, oh my goodness, all this interweaves and connects in this weird way that I never really thought about. So we'll just dive right in. Hold my hand and hold my breath. I am learning as I pretend to know what I am doing. I am so tired and worry more about you than myself. And how it all leads up to where I am now. Um, it took me a lot of years to kind of realize, like, 
Oh my goodness, all this. Time. Oh, let me interrupt. There's something audio going on that's unusual. Um, yeah, does anyone else terrible. hear that? It sounds like it's an echo of what Troy says, but it's later. I think somebody else needs to mute theirs, most likely, because it's like a repeat. So. Yeah, I'm going to mute everyone. Yeah. And then, except Troy. Um, So I'm going to mute all. And then Troy, I'm going to unmute. Let's try that. OK. Sorry about that, Troy. No, it's OK. I'll just start off here. Hold my hand and hold your breath. I am learning to pretend to know what I am doing. I am so tired and worry more for you than myself. I am restless in this domesticated life. I long for more for you and myself. Things seemed easy when it was only the pitter-patter of your little feet. Life can be so unkind. I see the way the light hits your face as you cry out for warmth. I see how it hits your face and shows the lines of wisdom through the good and the bad. We are the quiet and unspoken, yet we scream the loudest. Rest your tired eyes. I will cover you in warmth. We will move past this and carve out our own light against the darkest skies as the words, are you okay, fades from our lives. Now, that's just a really tight edit of the project that's probably got more than, if I had to say 200, 250 images, um, that can all be interchanged here and there. But I, to kind of sum up the fragility of fatherhood is basically my exploration as a stay-at-home dad, trying to be a father, trying to be a good husband, and trying to find my niche in this life. Um, I've never felt like I do that good of a job as a dad or as a husband, though I know I do. Um, I just always feel like it can all come crashing down at any given moment. And I think that's just kind of a lot of my upbringing of seeing like my family my mom and dad never had a great marriage and seeing like how my own, I, my sister's been through two marriages. In fact, she just called again this morning crying because her husband, she's in an abusive relationship. So I, I see all of this around me. I've seen my other sister's marriage fail. So I see all this and here I am trying to, I'm the oldest of five and I'm trying to make a good life for myself, but I'm continually questioning like, Am I doing the right things? Is photography the right way for me to be a good supporter of a family? You know, it's like, how do I take all this and roll it up in a ball and express that through my photography? And that's kind of where the fragility of fatherhood came about. But to really kind of get a good idea of the project and where I'm at now, um, you have to step back in my life and kind of look at my upbringing, um, even as Timothy said, my appliance repair that is insignificant to me only because I never want, never set out to do that or still don't want to do that. It's just part of it. So I grew up in a very rural town in north central Kansas. Um, population probably less than 3,000, only about three stoplights. As a young kid and moving into a young teen, I became big into skateboarding and punk music. It was kind of the counter, it was definitely the counterculture in a rural farming town. Um, and we would go sit at the local grocery store and look at the magazines for hours on end until they kicked us out. And if I was lucky enough, I would buy one and take one home. Um, that became my outlet to the outside world, um, kind of showing me arts and different cultures and things that I was not exposed to in a farming town. And it also led me to steal my parents' 35 millimeter film camera and I would go out and take pictures of me and my buds skateboarding. Now, as I talk about it now, I almost think I would take out their film and throw in my own film. So I probably ruined so much of their own film. It's ridiculous. <laughs> but a lot of times I had to literally sneak it out of the house because that was the only camera and they were afraid I was going to break it. But as I also did as a young kid, and I still do to this day somewhat, not as much as I used to, when I got a new album, I'd sit down, I'd look at the artwork, and I would listen to it with headphones on with the lyric sheet. Once to bounce to me, I didn't realize that I was actually staring at a lot of fine art photography that way. 
because a lot of bands tend to use whole images from artists. My love of music also led me to the film Singles in the late, mid, early 90s, you know, around the grunge, yeah, around the grunge area, era. Um, there was an image in there that I fell in love with. It was The Kiss at Hotel DeVille by Robert Dawson A. Now, you know, I, I loved it so much, I searched out in the early 90s a little postcard of that image and kept it up on my cork vision board as a young teen and had it for many years. You know, and it, I, it's weird because now I look back at all this, it's like that was my introduction to fine art photography and I had not a clue <laughs> about it. So as I moved on, I, you know, I fell in love with David Lynch films and I started playing more punk bands. But when I hit 19, I moved out, thought I could do the whole rock and roll thing and I landed flat on my face and ended up back at home. Um, so I started working two jobs and one of those jobs was actually just helping my grandma out at the appliance store she worked at. And then I was a fast food manager to boot. I did that for like two and a half years straight, two jobs, nonstop. And I was saving up all this money. Um, I wanted to become a producer of music. So I bought a lot of gear and I was also saving up to make this big move to, I don't know where. It, it was just this big plan. Well, I met my wife at the time in between all that. We fell in love. I adopted her oldest child. We had two kids. We bought a house that was built in the 60s that had never been touched. Um, and then by that point, I had been working in an appliance job for about 12 years. And during that moment, you know, I was working this appliance job and I was actually on the path to buy the, to buy the business from the owner. Um, within three months of us setting down and we started to draw up the paperwork, I actually blew out my L1 disc in the bottom of my back, mushroomed it out both sides. Left me laying in a hospital bed for a week, unable to walk. And during that week, I was like, what am I going to do with my life? I still loved all the music and I knew I wanted to do something creative. So I really started to kind of ponder, like, what am I going to do? What, where am I at with things? Um, so when my boss came in and asked me when I was coming back to work, I flat told him I quit. I had no plans, no nothing in mind. Here I was, I just quit a job, 12 years that I was actually going to buy. My wife was in um, finishing up her RN degree at the time. And we had a child on the way. And this was in June and come January, our youngest child, Easton, was born. So what I did like most parents did, you know, I picked up the camera and just started capturing you know, family snapshots. Um, they were simple. They were, they were boring. They were just, you know what I mean? It's, it's what you do when you get a new child. Almost everybody takes pictures of their kids. Um, I didn't, I was instant film and you know, I didn't really know, but it also led me to this idea of like, Oh my goodness, I enjoy taking pictures. I forgot how much I enjoy that process. And it, to me, it was magical. It was like, Oh my goodness, I forgot all about this. So I went back to school and started learning like more about photography. Um, it was within this image that things kind of started to click. And you know, it's far from perfect and it's most, the most cliche image now that I look back. We've got a girl in a dress walking away from us on railroad tracks, carrying a doll and Lord knows what's underneath that doll. I mean, who knows, it's terrible. But it was one of those things where I was proud of it at the time, and it kind of set me off into in motion of like, where can I go with this? So, and, you know, and I started studying the works of like Todd Heido and Gregory Crudson. So I started to play around with lighting, you know, throw my kids out in my backyard. Um, and that's the thing about like photography. I, I lived in the middle of nowhere. So I had to make do with what I had. And I was just starting a business. My wife had just finished art in school. We just had a new baby. So we did, I didn't have the funds to bring in a model from a six hour round trip. So it was like, I got to use what's around to me. And that was my children and my wife. And I also, you know, I started to mimic trends, you know, levitation trends in the early 2000s. But, you know, I was learning. I learned lighting. I learned Photoshop skills this way. You know, and I mimicked the Park Harrisons because I, I, it was the first work I kind of started to like realize, oh, there's underlying themes of man versus nature and flight and 
So, you know, we bought this cheap tuxedo suit at Walmart, got some rope, and we went out, you know, a mile out in the country and took an image, you know? <laughs> Things started to just keep growing. And then I started to realize like, oh my goodness, this landscape that I despised, that I always wanted to run away from, I, can, I started to appreciate it now. Because North Central Kansas is very flat. They're like clusters of trees. There's not a lot out there. So like this is an old abandoned highway. As you can tell, it's never been traveled on hardly ever. And I started to make use of that. But I was still using like masks within my photography. Um, you know, and it, I started to kind of also le learn like, oh, this is more of a collaboration between me and my kids, you know? I'd have these crazy ideas. I'd buy these crazy props at the local dollar store or whatnot, because it was what we had near us. And we'd go out and try to make, go out to this little cluster of trees and try to make this picture. I also learned like, even though I set out with that idea, things don't always work out that way, whether it be the wind or the kids like, that's uncomfortable, dad. So we le I learned to be flexible flexible and and I learned to get what I needed quickly um too painful because <laughs> taking your kids out of the country at dusk throwing mask on them it, that could be kind of hard for them you know it everybody hear me okay I just got a weird internet thing uh, there's a couple things that glitch every now okay. and then but okay it's, like it's working okay cool well, with everybody home, I just, it worries me. <laughs> but I knew, like, I was using masks and stuff to kind of conceal my children's identities. Because I, living in a rural area, I didn't, I didn't ever tell anybody, you know, what I did. Like, I didn't tell anybody I was studying photography. I didn't tell anybody I was, like, doing these weird photos of my kids out in the middle of the field with masks on. Because um, I was still running appliance. I started my own appliance business in the midst of all that. So it was like, I kept the world separate. But I knew I wanted to kind of strip away those things slowly. I wanted to get back to like my love of just portraiture and I wanted to keep things simple. So I kind of played with that for a little while, um, keeping the narrative a little bit easier, but I was still using the, the open landscape backdrop. I also started to, thanks to a mentor of mine, Michael Garlington, I also started to build my own props out of cardboard. Um, he had told me once, like, all you need is duct tape and cardboard, and you can build whatever you want. And so I was like, oh, that's cool. That can, I can make something interesting that is mine that nobody else can buy at the store. So we, like, built this eight-foot swan. Um, and if I remember right, my wife was actually behind there holding the swan up because it was actually windy that day. Um, so, you know, we started doing things like that. And I also learned, like, you can deceive the camera. Like, so that, that boat is only, it's only one, it's actually two sheets of cardboard, but it's only one sided. Um, you know, the, the camera at the end, the image is flat. So you can't tell that the boat is just one sided. And also my angle of shooting it upward, you know, it looks like it's out on an ocean, but it's actually just a light dusting of snow on a field, you know, and he's actually standing on a stool holding the two by four that was duct taped to the boat. So, you know, I kind of learned like the camera can be something that you can include. Everything through the viewfinder is what you allow to be in there. You can exclude it, you can include it. It's just what you're, you are in control of what's in that viewfinder. And to me, it was just all part of those building pride. Like learned throughout all those years, I learned lighting, I learned, you know, conceptual skills. I learned Photoshop skills. It just kind of kept adding up. I, but at the end of the day, I still wanted to kind of strip things down even more. Um, but I, I was like, okay, well, alternative processes might be the thing for me. It might be my go-to. So I started to play with alternative processes, but I also put myself on the other side of the camera, which I think is important for anyone. Um, it really kind of gives you a different perspective. Um, and that's something I ended up, after that, I never really did it again, but it's something I ended up playing with a lot on the fragility of fatherhood is I started stepping behind the camera again or in front of the camera again. Um, I think it's just that opening up allows you to be able to connect better with your sub subjects as a photographer. But I started to, like, I was still using my wife. I wanted to, 
it's not quite all the way stripped down like I wanted to, but it's still like my love of formal portraiture. Um, as I look at it now, it's like, man, there's way too many bird feathers strapped to her. It should have just been her and the crow. But, mm -hmm. you know, at the time I loved it. It was working for me. But I, you know, and then I started to strip it down even more. I was like, okay, I'm going to set out. I'm only going to use one prop, one subject. And so I, you know, my son and I, we just created a paper airplane and went out on a windy day. And, I, and we went for the most minimalistic image we could think of. And, you know, the negative sky against him holding the plane is kind of dreamy. Yet there's a little bit of tension in his face. But it was like, okay, I think I'm on to something here by stripping things down even more. So around 2015, I started to really think about that idea. Like, how do I have one prop with my subject in the work? But it was also around then I was just finishing up my bachelor's in photography at AAU. Um, my wife had finished her MSN, of, which is a master's of nursing at the time. And she was commuting a six hour round trip to work which she would go for three days and then come back. So I was left alone, raising three children in the house, actually four at the time, because our oldest hadn't quite moved out. So I, I started to kind of pick up more duties as a father, and which wasn't a bad thing, because I, I still, I've always, I was raised to do a lot of cooking and cleaning, so it wasn't a big deal to me, but still, when you're a family unit and somebody leaves, it's hard to adjust. Um, I. I, n I understand the plight that single parents have. It's, it's, that's, it's hard. But also, so we put our house up for sale, which took forever. So I had this whole mo idea of like, we are trying to move, we're bound to this house. And in that moment, we had a neighbor move in next door, like the kind that you would find on those nightmare neighbor shows. Um, he, the most meanest person I've ever met in my life. I actually ended in the hospital because my anxiety and I wasn't getting sleep so bad. My heart started palpitating. Um, so we were all in this weird like space. Like we're trying to move on, but yet we're trapped in our houses. And to make matters worse, my grandma became ill at the first of the year. She ended up passing as I made this project. But it's something like when I started the work, like I said, I just was one prop, one subject. But as the work progressed, it's, I started to put the pieces together, like, oh my goodness, this is all interrelated and interconnected. Like, this house is representative of like, how we're stuck in this house wanting to move on and we're sad here, but you know, it's, it's just a tough intermingling thing. And I, I, it's, for me, it's kind of the first step of home and family. And then, like, and then like, all this came to me after the fact, after my grandma passed away. Like this image here is a ton of bird feathers surrounding my son. We used to go to my grandma's all the time and she had four bird feeders right outside her kitchen window. And that's what we did. We'd sit there and watch the birds. And every once in a while, she'd get out her bird book and we would identify birds. And then this one, I only tell this to people about the image. I've never told any family members, but like my grandma and grandpa had a jar of candy in their kitchen. And we were always able to go over there any given time. The house was always unlocked. If it wasn't, we knew exactly where the key was. We could go in and get candy. Well, one day I went in. I was going to get some candy. The door was locked. Couldn't get in. I lifted up the fisherman's hat. The key was gone. So I went to the garage and got a flat blade screwdriver. I was probably 12 maybe. And I tried to pick the lock with the flat blade screwdriver. I tore it all to hell <laughs> and ruined it pretty much. And then later that night, everybody was calling around and wanting to know like who tried to get into grandma's house. And I lied and said, it wasn't me. So they ended up filing a police report and they thought somebody tried to break into their house. And to this day, I've never told anybody, but I, you know, for me, that was what that image, you know, reflects as, as I look back, even though I didn't make it like that, that's what, I was able to find a meeting and attach to it after the fact. And then I also learned like after somebody passes, which is really strange to me, especially as one that really loves family photo albums, is like a lot of things get disregarded. They get dispersed amongst family members and you don't really know where anything goes or if they even keep it. 
So I was able to, and lucky enough to get a hold of the, the toy animals, which were what I played with as a child, and then what my kids played with. It. And my grandma, before she passed, even got to have some great great grandkids. So they'd been around for all these generations. And it, I, at the time, I just had used them in a photo. But as I look back, it's like, holy cow, it's really representative like, of play and family. And then I'm able to attach like, these meanings of like, what does those items mean after we're gone? I mean, do, do toys represent a family history or a family photo album? I, that's a question I don't know and I can't really answer at yeah. this time, but I know what it means to me. So around, all that kind of ended around May and we put our house up for sale October of 14 and all this kind of ended around May. And then come July, we finally had sold our house, which was super exciting. And, it, and it's, and it, you know, you're like, well, what does this have to do with photography? Well, it does. <laughs> it really does for, for me because I was leaving the landscape I knew and loved that I'd learned to make work in. And I was able to go out a mile out in the country. Nobody would be around. I could do whatever I wanted. Moving to an urban area, that is just not a possibility. So I started to like think about how, what kind of work am I going to make? And I'd also, in my mind, I was leaving behind, like I had sold my appliance business. I was like, I'm not doing that anymore. I am done. Um, and that was like part of the whole thing. And I, right after we moved, I had actually enrolled into the graduate program here at AU as well. So like there was all these big life decisions taking place. We sold our house. We had moved across the state. I quit my job. I'd ran my plants business since 2007 until 2015. So it's like all these giant moves that ended up here. So I was like, okay, so what do I do? So I stepped out to what like I could think of. I was like, okay, I need to make work like trying to find my connection to this place. So I took our middle son that I'd used for a lot of years and started making some of this work um, you know it was I'd stripped it all the way down to where it was just him and the landscape so I was proud of that but none of it ever stuck with me I never felt any connection to it and even to this day it's still like ah, it's okay work but I don't find anything personal about it I don't and maybe it's simply because even five years later of living here I don't really find a connection to the my landscape or my place here and maybe that's why but one thing that you don't see the entire time of all these years of taking all these photographs is that my youngest son, Easton, always went with us. Um, and I don't know if it's because he really related to, like I had a bribery system. Um, anybody that works with their children or siblings knows that like, you, sometimes they'll be helpful and it's no problem, but other times you have to bribe them. And with Eli, the middle son, it was always jelly beans. And I don't know if Easton related it to that, to where like, oh, we're gonna get candy after this. So he went along, but it doesn't matter. Either way, he always went with us and I always enjoyed it. And a lot of times he was a big help to be in there. He'd hold something or go get something. But it wasn't really until I took this image in February of 2016, it was like, I took it, I didn't think anything of it because I was working with Eli on something else. And I went back that evening and, and pulled it up on the computer and I was like, whoa, wait a minute. There's something kind of here. It was enough to light a spark like, oh, there's something here. And around that time, we'd been living here since the J July of before that year. And Easton's anxiety and had kind of spiked. He'd always had really bad anxiety and he's always been really restless. He also started having migraines, like so much so like one eye will, in children, one eye will really dilate really big. Um, thankfully, we've got all that. It's all under control now besides the anxiety, which that's a, that's a whole nother beast on its own. But I started like just documenting him. And for me, it was like a way, it was exciting because everything I'd ever done was planned and like, that last series, I actually sketched out images and like, I, this was just on the spur. I would, I'd leave the camera in the living room, I'd grab it as I needed, I'd take the picture or we'd go out for a walk. I would find pictures. Um, 
I caught moments of him screaming at me because we didn't want to leave the playground. You know, moments of just like, there's just an angst and frust frustration. You know, he's going super fast down the hill, so much so that me as a father, I'm just paranoid that you're going to crash, buddy. Um, you know, as we'd go out for walks, and I think he found a connection to nature, like, because we'd always go out in the woods at all those other photo shoots, and I think he found, like, a connection of going out there and just, he found it was relaxing to him, is kind of how I viewed it. Or there was moments of him, you know, not feeling well and, you know, relaxing in the hot bathtub. I took things that he had made at school that kind of reflected he was supposed to draw on a plate how he felt that day and he made this face and I just had him hold it up to his face after school one day and just took the image it's not a happy face it's not a sad face it's just it's just kind of melancholy and it, you know it's and to me with that against the bruises on the arm it's just a really sad image but there was also a lot of days of him you know he was still pretty young at the time wanting to go outside and play with you know out in the neighborhood and there was a lot of staring out the windows. Again, he's out in the woods. There's, you can get kind of the tranquility, but yet you kind of see how small he is against the world. And it was with that work, I was like, I did that work for probably about a year, and it was titled, This Will Pass, I Promise You. And I was like, okay, I, I, I could keep doing this, but it's like, what do I do from here? It's like, I need to explore it. I need to kind of dive into things a little bit deeper. So I really went down a rabbit hole of like others that work with family photography. Um, I went down deep. I didn't really know these. There were so many out there that have done it over all the years. I fell in love with Emmett Gowan. I really fell in love with his work with Edith. Um, I fell in love with the work with Jake Shivery. While he doesn't necessarily work with like his immediate family, he works with all of his friends, which could be classified as family. And then Danny Wilcox Frazier, I know he's purely documentary, but the work Driftless covers certain families. And it, there was just something about the grit, the grime. It's not perfect, it's just rough and it's raw. And I just really resonated to that. And that's something I just love in photography is just, it's just raw right there in front of you. And we also started to spend living here near Kansas City. We'd go to the Nelson Atkins. And I really started to spend a lot more time in the bar, Baroque room. Um, has a lot of old masters paintings. And I really started to study like their use of light and their posturing within the paintings. Easton would tend to go with me, but probably within 15 minutes, he was just done. He was ready to go. And we actually, most of the time, wouldn't even make it down to the photography room because he was just ready to leave. I also fell in love with the film Blue Valentine. Um, it's not necessarily a, a reflection of like my life, but it was that raw emotion in that film, especially that Indian scene of like, you see this marriage start off on a rocky start, you see kind of a high and then you see it dip low and then you see them try to recover. And then at the end, it's just heart wrenching. And every time I watch that scene, I just, it brings tears to my eyes, but it's like, okay, that is an emotional tug of like, how do I, how do I find that in photography? Like, how do I display that emotion in photography? And then I kind of fell in love with the Florida project too. It's just the, it's just these kids running wild. And it was something about, I think it's the children because I just truly love children. Um, I think it's because I come from a big family and I have a lot of kids. I think that's why, but it was just kind of this wild, era of like these kids against this big corporate monster of Disney and it's kind of, so I really started to kind of step back and think like okay I love the, the I love family portraiture I love people that work with their family I love all these films that are really emotionally charged it's like how do I take that and start to build a new some work from what I was doing so I started to look a little more inward I also started to play with this idea of layering in a photograph um, with the foreground, middle ground, and background. In the foreground, you can kind of see like my shadow. In the middle ground, you see Easton. In the background, you see the reflection in the tree. I started like for me, and you see a lot of that within the project that opens up more of, of a dialogue. And then it's also, I find it to be more, a, more of an intelligent image 
to where you start to have more questions and you can kind of start to see things, see things a little more. But I also like this work, I just captured what I saw in front of me at most times. Like that was my wife. This was more of a assisted reality image to where it's like she was sleeping and I drove out the camera and I was like, hold it, don't move. Cause she kind of woke up and I took the picture. This is more of a straight documentary image. Like this, we were out for a walk and this is exactly what we saw that day. And then this is more of a completely constructed image. Like I wanted my wife to look somber and sad after a hot shower to where we open up this whole dialogue of like, why, what, what's going on? Is she sad because like everything's falling apart? Is she just sad because it's been a long day? What's the meaning here? And that's something I was striving for in the image. And then there was, there's still like, now that they're teens, they don't necessarily console each other all the time, but they still, they used to quite a bit. And this was Easton and his brother. Um, Eli was a good companion. He's, he's got such a sweet heart and he was trying to help Easton get over. I don't remember exactly what went on that day, but he was allowing Easton to kind of hang out and chill and recoup whatever was going on that day. And to me, Easton was pretty much asleep and it was one of those things that I stumbled upon it. I was like, stay there. I went and grabbed my camera and took the image and I'm playing off that notion of like my love of Baroque paintings. It's like the, the gesturing of the figures and the lighting. And then like, this is completely constructed. It's, it's a self portrait with my wife's hand and it's, it leaves open this door of a narrative of like, is, what is she reaching out to him? Is he not responding? Is it a gesture of help or is it a gesture of, of leaving? And it's that notion of that fragility of a relationship that I wanted to capture within the image. And I, I'm unshaven, I'm dirty, I'm not really dirty, but I'm just, I'm rough, you know? Um, and then there was Easton laying on our bed on a nice day where he should have been outside playing. And again, it's, I'm employing like that use of lighting that I absolutely love within the imagery. And then and reckoning back to my love of straight portraiture, um, this is actually still one of my favorite images of Eastern I've ever captured. Does it have a point or a place in this work? I don't know, maybe in a larger scale like a book, but it's just something I find, um, I just love straight portraiture. And to me, this is an honest image of him. But then I started stepping back even more with that idea of layers. Um, my wife has a pretty demanding job. She teaches, she, at this time she was teaching nursing while still being a nurse. So she was basically working double um, while I'm at home with the children. God bless her. Um, and, you know, she tried, we used to spend a ton of time in our vehicles and, she, and especially until just recently she did because she has about a 40 minute commute one way each day. And so she tries to leave everything at the door before she comes into the house. And this was that image of her trying to find that inner peace and trying, you know, not to find the strength to come in, but to find the strength to leave work in the vehicle. Because otherwise, if she brings it in, we talk about it all night long. That's like our topic. And she tries to come in with a clear head. And then there were still moments of Easton, just being Easton, that warm your heart, being a playful kid. And, you know, he still doesn't hold still very well at 13. He still finds, puts himself in tiny niches. He still sits on his legs tucked up under him at the table. You're lucky to get him to hold still at dinner time for 15 minutes. That's pushing it. So that's kind of where that's like some outtakes of all that work. So it's like, well, post-grad, it's like, well, what have you done since graduate school since May? Well, that's a big question. And I've got a lot of answers here because I spent a ton of time just resting that first month or two. I was still doing photography related stuff. I was still submitting work, still keeping in contact with people. But that's something I've learned since graduate school is like, and I gave myself a goal is like, I do something photography related every single day. Um, it may not always be taking pictures because I've learned since then, like if I try to force anything lately, 
it, I'm not pleased with it. Not doesn't mean the results not good. It's just I'm not pleased with it. Um, and I think, and I'll touch on that in a minute. But that includes like reaching out to galleries, reaching out to curators, reaching out to people I've met at um, portfolio reviews over the years. Um, it means checking out the submissions out there, making sure it's in line with what I need or where I need to go and in line with my work. But it's also, I spend a ton of time reading about photography and diving into those that are still working with their family. Since even graduating, I've found, I don't know, probably 15 people that I never knew about working with their family that I just, I keep finding more and more and more. And I, I just absolutely love that subject. So I just keep diving into it. So, like, when I made the Fragility of Fatherhood, I honestly really thought that, like, it could go on forever. Um, and now that I'm kind of past it a little bit and I'm still making some work, I don't know if that's necessarily the case. Um, Eastern turned 13 in January. Eli is, will be 17 here in a few months. Um, we're going to be empty nesters before long. We've never we've been together 25 years and never not had a child in the home so it's like do i start to focus in on being an empty nester do i focus in on my wife what do i do here so i've kind of just let all of that go like i'm not going to focus in on any one idea because when eastern turned 13 i was like i'm going to make a series about him being 13 i'm going to make an image every week and then i'm going to just build it up for a year and then i'm going to put together a series well i threw that out the window like, I'm not going to give myself that limitation. So like, I'm going to go through some of the work that I've made. Like this is an image of Easton just kind of hanging out in the light. It focuses in, in on his zits because he's becoming a preteen. Now he may not like this image in a few years, but I think it's poignant to show like in, as you look at this image and look at the larger scope of all my work with him, it's interesting to see that growth. Here he is on a cold day, hiding out behind the pillow, um, away from the camera. He's starting to pull away a little bit from the camera. I spend a ton of time doing housework, um, especially now since everybody's home, I'm probably doing dishes five to six times a day. We have a dishwasher <laughs> and as an appliance repairman, I assure you that it's working. It's just that I don't like dishwashers. Um, and I don't know, this is crazy. I don't know if it's because like ours broke as a child and my parents couldn't afford to fix it or what it is, or if I just like the meditative fact of doing dishes. So I start, I captured, this is my life. Like I stand a lot of times in front of this window, but I also found it as I was going through my work, I found it to be an interesting in juxtaposition against this image of Easton staring out the window with a hand holding the shade back. Um, to me, I haven't quite figured out the dialogue yet. I haven't spent a ton of time pulling them up. I need to print them out and hang them on the wall. And then I could probably figure out exactly why it works for me. But there's something there. I captured my shavings in, in the bathroom sink. The most mundane thing ever, but it is a part of daily life. I've captured our dirty basement window after a rainstorm. We're dealing, there again, we're dealing with this idea of layers, foreground, middle ground, background. We're dealing with this idea of inward looking out. Um, we're in my house looking out at another house that is actually, you can't see in at all. Um, yeah, it's, I'm still playing with some of those ideas, but it's in a different way. I captured my Edith, my lovely wife here. It's kind of a calm, peaceful image. But when you compare it to this one where her hair is just this tangled mess after a shower, um, it's an, Again, there's a dialogue there. And then I captured this image not, oh, maybe not even a month ago. Um, it's interesting because up here on the top left of the frame, you don't see it. Easton's actually buried under three blankets with a jacket on, midday in the house with the sun on him. Um, we have diagonal lines of the sheets running one way and his arms running the other way, but the warmth of the sun is hitting his hand. And to me, on the hand, the weird thing about it is, is it come, almost comes off childlike. I don't, it doesn't appear to be a teenager's hand. And I, that just kind of warms my heart in a way. Because um, like I said, maybe I'm getting a little bit empty nester feeling, but 
like that warms my heart to see this young child yet. And then we have our quarantine hair. Um, it's just unruly at this point. And we're still having moments of unease and unrest. Um, he has not left the house since, I don't even think he's been outside besides the front porch. He hasn't left the house since March 10th, I believe. Um, he finally admitted a week ago that like, he's really scared and he broke down. So his anxiety and stuff is still there. Um, you know, it's just, that's kind of a tearjerker of an image to kind of leave it at. <laughs> that's where I'm gonna leave it at. I do have some final words like, you know, over all this, I never set out to photograph my family. I did it out of necessity. Um, and I was telling Timothy this the other day, I was like, if I lived in an urban area and had access to models, I don't know where I would have been at in my photography career at this point. Um, so I really don't know. The biggest thing I've learned is like photography is a long game. You have to get used to hearing the word no. You have to be willing to just keep throwing yourself out there and to build any project, and this is where I'm at now, is like you have to give it time, you have to give it effort, and you have to love it, and it has to come from the heart. And you know, that'll give you what you, that'll give you the success you desire. So like I said, in the end, I never set out to make images of my family. It just came out of necessity. And now I wouldn't really have it any other way. Because as I look back at all this work, it's like, this is like, I don't take pictures, family snapshots, Ever. So like this is my fo family photo album in just this weird, odd way that I can hope others can appreciate. Thank you. That was great. Thanks. Um, that was super. Let's give him a round of applause. These guys do clap. <laughs> the, uh, no, that was totally great. Hey, let's jump into some of these questions. And then if you have other, if anyone else has questions as we read these, you know, things will, things will come up. Um, but you know, during the course of your talk, various questions kind of came through here. Um, let me just find them here. Um, first of all, from Renee Rogoff, thank your wife for her service as a nurse. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Very she's kind. she is teaching nurses now, but she's flat told me many times, like if it it gets really bad here uh, in Kansas, which it might be in Missouri's. 45 minutes away and they're kind of out there a little bit, she will jump to the need. She's told me that many, many times. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. No, thank you for sure. The, you know, hey, I'm worried, I'm, I'm wondering, upon graduating, like school is intense and school, you know, gives you deadlines and gives you things that you have to get done and you have to, um, I don't know what your education was like at the academy, but you know, there's assignments and then there's, finding your own work and exploring these things. When school ended, do you feel that you had momentum to move forward or was there a shock to your system trying to figure out how to, how do I make work now? Both, both. I had a good momentum right out of the gate. Like I came out hard. I was making weekly images, like I was on the go. And then it was just kind of, a lot of them felt forced. And I was like, okay, something's not right here. Um, and I, got, I had to figure it out. And, you know, I started this, as you come out, and I also spent a lot more time like, okay, I need to get this work out there. Like I put in all this time and effort. So I started spending more time like marketing the work and connecting. And I, and I still was making images really good until probably that first week of March, because I was supposed to go to a Houston Photo Fest. And I was like, okay, I'm going to fine tune my portfolio and throw together something new for like that. I spent like two weeks and then got there and it got canceled. And um, I picked up the camera again a little bit since then, but not so much. Um, I give myself my own deadlines. It's like when Easton turns 15, it's like, okay, I'm going to make an image a week. Um, you know, and then, and then I kind of learned like, oh, I can't force that. So it's, that's been a little bit of a struggle. I mean, I, I'll be honest. It's not, those deadlines were great. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and then I took, I approached every one of those deadlines in all seriousness. Like, I'm going to make an image that stands on its own that I am not afraid to throw out there. Yeah. Like, I took it with every bit of serious, every bit I could. Um, and now it's just like, I can pull up my camera because I haven't uploaded them in probably three or four days. And there's just a ton of just like 
I'm just randomly shooting things sometimes. And I, and I think it's just that act of, I still am photographing. It's like, I'm not necessarily always photographing with intent, but I'm still just photographing. And I think that's important. Yeah. It's keeping yeah. that muscle reflex going, I guess. Oh yeah, yeah. No, you don't write number one songs over and over and over again. You know what yeah, I mean? and you can't give yourself that expectation of like I've got to always get a number one because, and I think that's where I was at. It's like I, I'm never always going to get a number one. It's not going to happen. Right. You know, you got to get through the bad work to get the good work. Yeah. 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 It's like a dialogue you have over a long period of time. I think, and there's yeah. periods where it yields a lot of good, like any friendship, and then there's periods where ah, eh, we're not feeling it. Yeah, and that's like with this will pass, I promise you. That worked, and then I didn't really touch on it. That worked really totally ebbed and flowed. It was like there were some weeks where it was like 15 images, and the next week I got one. Right, right. Yeah. I think the students could relate to that for sure. Um, hey, here are some other questions uh, from PH. It says, I see you're drawn to symbology. Is it easier for you to communicate via visual riddles rather than documentation? No judgment, just an observation. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I don't take any judgment to it. And I, you know, it, like if you start to think back to like that older work, um, there's a to A, living in a very conservative rural town. It's my way of bucking those, I, you know, norms. Um, and I, I'm still pretty much not a counterculture person, but I kind of like, I'm kind of a nomad and I'm kind of out there sometimes on some things. Like I like a lot of darker, weird movies. I like foreign films and I don't always feel like I'm in like the norm as that goes. But yeah, there is a lot of symbolism in it. And I think that goes back to like, like, when I was introduced, when at the Academy, I was introduced to Michael Garlington's work. And I think that his work, well, it's, it was chock full of symbolism. Um, and I, that really drew me in, like, all, how you could do that and how you could, like, push those buttons. And that, that's where a lot of that early, early work was. It, yeah, it, it probably was me. Like, I'm going to throw that weird, creepy clown out in the field because I know that can push some buttons. <laughs> I don't know if that answers his question or not. <laughs> as long as okay. we got the creepy clown in there, I'm satisfied. <laughs> and that was well before I knew about that whole clown trend. I watched some documentary on Hulu about some creepy clown, and I didn't even know about that at the time. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Who among <laughs> us has not wanted to dress someone up like a creepy clown and photograph them in a bleak uh, forest? Yeah, who among us? Um, let them cast the first stone. Uh, here's another question. Uh, how do you feel your overall relationship with your kids differed because you photographed them? Like, and you photographed many of them at different times. Yeah, yeah, and I photographed our, our oldest. Um, he's 26, which none of that work is in here because it's pretty bad. I know I take that back. He is the clown. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I've never heard anything bad. Like our daughter stepped out of it pretty early. Um, and I think that was because she got her first cell phone camera and she was a girl and started to, wanted to control how she viewed herself through sure. an image more than, you know, the boys. Yeah. Um, Eli's will be 17 this year. Um, I was actually going through prints a couple days ago, trying to just clean up stuff. And I found an old print of him wearing wings standing out in the field and he I was just gonna shred it because it was cheap paper and whatnot and he was like oh I want that to put in my room so like he views it more as a, a relationship thing maybe with me and as a good time um Easton's still helpful he's pulled back a little bit but yeah I don't know I mean I think it's good I don't ever hear otherwise I think that like they've grown up around it. So it's like, they, this is what dad does. They don't know any different. I think the question isn't, is it good or bad? The question is, does it change the relationship with your kid? 
But if I, you photographed every kid, I guess there's no way you could know because you photo that's all you've ever done. Yeah, that's all I've ever done. Yeah. Yeah, I Yeah, I don't know. Maybe in 15 years that's something I might have the answer to. Them. You know, and then that brings up a whole nother question. It's like when I showed this work out to Chico, um, there was a reviewer that told me, keep making the work, put it all away, and don't show it to anyone until you're 60. Which I was like, well, that's really hard to do. But he's like, the work is too personal to share, and you're not in the right mental capacity to share this work with the world. Who said that? Interesting thing to think about. That's hard to do because as a creator, you want to share what you're doing. I don't, I don't get it, honestly. I mean, well, I don't either because I mean, I want to share the, like, I want to share our family from this viewpoint from a father against what we tend to see on social media all the time. Like we tend to see this idealistic family that we know is not achievable. Like, we, we all know when you post something on Instagram, a selfie, we take 10 selfies, we pick the best one and we do a quick little edit before we even throw it up on there. And then same, that same is true for family photography. You know, I, I ha and I love him to death. I have a good, and I don't know if he's on here, but I have a good friend that lives in out in LA that like everything that he shows of him with his children is just perfect. And life is not that way. We all know that. <laughs> Oh yeah, I think we should share that. Yeah, you know, let's move into a similar question, but it says for your can, this is from Jeff Briner. He goes, for your candid shots with your son, how do you transition from dad to photographer and then back to dad again? It's pretty simple sometimes. Um, Cause I really like, even now I have two cameras sitting upstairs on a night or on our lamp table like in the living room, they're always there ready to go. Um, so I, I, it's just a matter of fact, I just pick it up and go. As far as like when it, it's more of a assisted image, like, oh, I see them doing that, hold that. Um, sometimes I get, oh, not dad, dad, not now, come on. I'm like, just give me a minute. And that relates back to that early work with like out in the field and out with wind and whatnot. I learned to work fast. Like some of these shots I may get, three or four frames and that's it. Um, you know, I mean, I don't get the luxury of like, I can shoot 20 images here. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's with my wife, I have that opportunity at times, but with my kids, I don't. So it's yeah. like, you gotta work fast. So that notion of like switching gears doesn't, it just, it happens naturally and it happens fast. Oh, there it's have been moments of like, where I intruded on Eastern, he was having a breakdown and he was getting ready to take a bath and he was screaming and yelling and I took the picture and he was actually pushing his hand away from the camera. And that was when a moment when I had to step back and think like, okay, do I need to be the photographer here or do I need to be the dad? And I, I took, I think two frames of that and I put the camera down. I was like, I've got to play, I play the dad role. Or I've got to be the dad. Like, so I've learned over the years. Cause like that started what? late 2015 so it's been five years of shooting intimately with my family uh yeah that makes sense the uh here's another question from Zaying wang um in some of your photos on your website the models do not look at the camera or they close their eyes why would you choose not to make eye contact <laughs> i can't answer that to be honest with you <laughs> I, you know, and that's the thing is like, I was taught like focusing on the eye. And when I do portraiture, like straight portraiture, that's my focal point is the eye. Like follow, like right here, look at the lens. You know what I mean? That's like, I think it just gives a contemplative look to the imagery. Like, you know, it's, it just, it adds a little bit of calm to the image because you don't get that direct stare. Yeah. Um, a little bit more mystery. And I think that may be some of it. I, it's kind of beating around the question there. <laughs> I think <laughs> I, I don't have a solid answer. No, I think you answered because that's what your pictures when your kids have their eyes closed. Yeah, to me, it seems like they're thinking or they're dreaming. 
or we're getting to look at them and we don't have to deal with them looking back at us or something like that. And it changes it. And they're a little more, I can spend a little more time on them. You know what I mean? As a viewer. Yeah. Yeah. Cause as a direct stare, you know, a, you may not want to stare at the image for too long. Um, cause it might be conf confrontational or it may not be like that one of him screaming. I mean, that is a confrontational image. Yeah. Um, so it's like, how much longer do you need to sit there and look at that one when he's sitting there directly screaming at you? You've got, you've got the idea of the photograph. He's mad. He's yelling at the photographer and that's it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Here is from Renee Rogoff. Um, it may be too soon to ask you, but let's try. As a fine art photographer uh, herself, how did you take your fine art into commerce for yourself? Like, what is your fine art? What is the career aspect of your fine art career? Well, um, every once in a while, I'm lucky enough, I might sell one to two prints a year. Oh, wait, we lost you. We lost you due to the internet. Can you repeat that? Oh, I, if I'm lucky, can you hear me okay now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. If I'm lucky enough, I might be able to sell one or two prints a year. Um, I've found that to be harder with family work. Um, there's just something there like with that. Now I've been lucky enough to where um, some newspapers and magazines have reached out to me wanting to license an image. So I've done some of that. Um, and then on, I don't know if I can share. Can I still share? Yeah, yeah. Share Let's my see screen. Those okay. Yeah. We um, I have been lucky enough, like in my past life of loving rock and roll, my friends did, like my good friends went on to be signed with Sony in the early or the late 2000s, early 2000s, late 90s. Um, they actually just put out a new record, but I'd made a lot of friends that were in bands over the years. And I've just kind of remained in contact with them just because I'm a huge music fan. And that's something I've been doing since quarantine is like, I go down to my CD pile and I pull out 30 CDs and we listen to them through the week and they change every week. But through the years, um, I've been contacted by a band um, out of Dayton, Ohio, that has close ties to Hawthorne Heights. I don't know if anybody, they're kind of the late 2000s, early 2000s hardcore band. But I have been commissioned over the years, not really necessarily commissioned, but they would go through my website and pull images and then ask to use them. Um, I don't remember what year this was. Um, that was around 2015. They used a self portrait of me and then the house image on the front. Ah, that's great. Yeah, absolutely great. And it's an actual, rec it's like a clear record. Yeah. And, and just the end of last year, they actually took the image of Easton that had drawn a face. They photoshopped the pencil drawing out on it, but they put out a record last year. Um, it's got that image on the front, and then it's got another image on the back. Um, they've made, you know, posters and whatnot, and licensed. They licensed full usage of that image. Um, being friends. And just overall, all around nice guys. I don't really worry too much. Like I'm not as stringent with contract with them as I am with a newspaper. Like you only get three months of using this image on print and online. With them, I'm a little more flexible. And they, you know, they took the image recently. And they just put out a new video last end of last month, and they <laughs> they took their love of Star Wars and then like you know had Darth Maul pulling down the paper plate within the music video, which was just it was they didn't ask me about it or anything and it was just so hilarious that i just i loved it so those those are some ways that i make some extra cash on it um unfortunately or fortunately i still do some appliance repair here and there like not a lot maybe one or two a week if that but you know it's enough to keep it it keeps my hands busy um I can't do it for much longer because of my back. I just, I, I can't, but it keeps me busy. Um, but yeah, so I've kind of found like this weird niche and I, I have to be honest, like I am super thankful and grateful. My wife has a great job right now to where like, I, that's not my main concern. It's like, like I don't need to make 50,000 a year to survive. Like I can piece together this living right now and she's super supportive. So yeah. Yeah, that's a fair answer for sure. Hey, other questions are coming in here. Um, 
Oh, here is one I had. If you couldn't shoot family, what would you shoot? I'd probably go back to the more weird, crazy conceptual stuff. <laughs> But at that, I would probably have to get models. Um, I've tried my hand at landscape. I've tried that. Um, that's hard. It's just not for me. I've tried it multiple times. Have you seen the work of Judith Joy Ross? Do you know who she is? Judith Joy no. Ross? No. She shoots by 10, she does portraits, and there's nothing creepy about her work at all, but just an absolutely beautiful, straightforward portrait photographer. And see, that might you know. be. That would be an option too. I mean, I, that's something I do do every once in a great while. I'll drag out my four by five and, you know, I have three boxes of type 55 left and I try to see if it's any good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think her work would inform you. Like your straightest stuff would, would fit right into that, you know. Um, oh, let's see. Uh, here's a follow-up question from Jeff Breiner. It says, on your setup shots with your kids, do you involve your kids with the concept creation? Oh, the earlier stuff? Yeah, totally. Yeah. I would say, like, this is what we're going to do. It's like, you know, <laughs> it's not on here, but one time we actually built a giant paper airplane. It was probably 12 foot in length. Um, and, you know, like, we strapped it to, like, I have a family minivan, and that was that's also served as my service vehicle. And we roped it to the top of the van, and the boys and I were driving out in the country and it was windy and the, it blew off the van one day <laughs> and went right beside a bridge like almost into the water we put it back on oh yeah they totally knew what we were going to do it's like we're gonna, i'm building this paper airplane you're going to sit on it and we're going to take a picture you know and it didn't necessarily work out that way yeah um but it, you know we found a way to make it work and that's a lot of what like that pre-planned conceptual stuff is is like okay we've got this good idea but it's going to change yeah. <laughs> once we're there. You have right. to be open to that and you have to learn to roll with that because a lot of times what you'll find out is like your original idea was not as good as what actually happened. Oh, that is true. Yeah, you have to be. You know that as probably some of your commercial work, you know. Oh, there's a very dry idea on the in the meeting and then when you get there things come alive you know yeah but that's yeah. the nature of commercial work you know yeah and that's kind of the nature of like conceptual shots it's like you have a good solid idea but things happen you know yeah. the plane doesn't want to stand up on two by fours in the middle of a field the ground's on level the wind's blowing and a little 50 pound body isn't enough to hold that plane up <laughs> you know because that, that was the original intent was him, of him to carry the paper airplane on his back and it's just like, it wasn't possible. <laughs> what did you guys make that paper airplane out of? Cardboard. Nice. Hey, just looking through the questions here. Um, uh, is, uh, why do you shoot in black and white? I think I just started off with black and white. Um, you know, it's the most boring answer probably. It was like, it stripped away all the emotion that color had. Um, and I just stuck with it. Um, for me, it also brings alive some of those formal elements that I tend to like about photography. I mean, if someone said, you need to, we love your work, but you got to shoot this in color, would you be like, uh -huh, I don't do it? Or would you be like, okay, where do I, where do I, show me where to push the button? Um, I would try to try color, um, and I've tried color over the years. Um, yeah, I, I just, my eyes see in black and white. So it's hard to shift to color um, at this point. And I, trust me, I've pondered it multiple times. It's like, maybe I should try color. With the family work, um, color's tough because you're not always wearing the same clothing. The environment's never, the environment, yeah, it's all within the home or within the yard, but the colors can clash. The lighting is never the greatest. I mean, you might have a tungsten image versus a, you know, cast daylight image in a series of work, and then it probably wouldn't gel unless you had the right colors. Very rarely do you see a photographer who works successfully or exclusively in black and white make a successful shift to color. But Bruce Gilden did it. And 
you know, he did it at age like 65 or something like that. Like, <laughs> well, there's still hope then. <laughs> well, what I'm di- actually, I, I don't mean it in that way, but I mean it like I was impressed that this guy who had been made his entire career shooting black and white suddenly was able to shift at that age. Yeah. Know? And, and then, you know, that brings up a whole like another question. And it's like, am I limiting myself to where this work can go because it is black and white? Uh, I think I wouldn't say my opinion is you're not limiting yourself artistically where it could go. I would say if you were trying to play in the commercial ballpark, it would be limiting. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. Um, Here's a couple more questions. Uh, Chris Lattimore. Well, someone, uh, someone said, uh, this wasn't a question, but I need to read it. Shane Hairston said, love weird, crazy, conceptual, (laughs) LOL. Um, and then someone else said, right up your alley, Shane. Um, uh, Chris Lattimore says, different color cast may be interesting in your work, but you've worked hard on your tonality, and that is part of the narrative to me. So I think mm-hmm. that was a comment on the, on the black and white. Yeah. Um, then, let's see, we had another question here. Um, Hi, Chris, by the way. <laughs> Chris was an amazing uh, instructor. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> uh, yeah. The... Um, uh, from Adrian, what do you recommend to students working on long-term fine art projects that they want to get out there in the world? Uh, she goes, I have my advanced, super awesome fine art project students here with me today. And so awesome. she's doing that for them and for all of us. Well, honestly, when I started throwing things out in the world, it was like right after that clown image kind of and the stuff that was really Park Harrison related. I was super but probably six months in my first solo show, which is rare. And then it's also super rare that they paid for all the printing and all the framing. I had nothing out of pocket, which that, that just doesn't happen. Um, that's awesome. Yeah. That's like the most rare thing. Um, Where was that? At the Rojo Gallery in Cincinnati. They're not around anymore. And how did you get that? It was... They had did a juried show through, a, they yeah. put an advertisement in, not Pro Photo Magazine, I don't even know if it's around anymore, but it was a magazine that Sean Dugan was in, and I picked, started subscribing to it, and they just sort of ran a little ad, like they were calling for photographs, it was a juried exhibition, I did that one, and then I just kind of remained in contact, because I had gotten like one image in or something like that, Yeah. and then after that, they just did a whole show, I think it was... 25 or 30 pieces you know it was the clown work with then with the um winged flying type stuff um and that was just luck i mean <laughs> it's just yeah. luck and then probably two years later they are no no longer around which tends to happen with small galleries yeah um but i was naive on that because like i came out of the gate just throwing some of the stuff out there not really knowing, not researching like the calls and like who the juror was and the themes. Um, and it's, I just got lucky on some of that, but I started to pay more attention to like the themes of open calls, the jurors. Um, I know, and I learned along the way, like this can get expensive really fast. Yeah. Um, Cause I was trying for everything. Because I was naive, I got that big show, and I was like, "Okay, I can make things happen. I'm just gonna go for it." And you know, I did the cold emailing, which I, you know, later in life learned like, don't do that. Yeah. Which it's funny that you know I learned that, and I never did it. And then I had a meeting with Francesca. Um, I can't think of her last name, but she owns a gallery overseas, Francesca Mafio Gallery. Um, in Great Britain and I did like a mentorship with her right out of grad school like where to send my work and kind of how to do it and she was like here she gave me a list of names and contacts she's like cold cold email these people and I'm like what are you serious she's like just tell them you know me and I you know out of 10 emails I had eight responses which I was just floored like because you send a cold email and it's going to go to the trash most of the time so that's like super rare but I just paid attention to, to, you know, the open calls out there. I started to focus in on more of the free calls of yeah. submissions. Like there's a couple right now, um, the Candela one, 
and then Flack Photo. I don't think Flack Photo costs. I think it's free. Those are two really good ones. And with the way things are right now with the Candillo one, you won't have any money on print or shipping because it's going to be all online. Yeah. So that's, that's a plus, especially if you're cash strapped. Um, mm -hmm. I did that. I did my first portfolio review in 2015, I think. No, before that, well before that. Might have been, no, it was 2012. Um, and I was ill prepared. I had no idea what I was doing. I took an iPad when iPads were just starting to come around. I took an iPad with a, a app that had a portfolio thing on it. Um, that's all I took. I took a couple of artist statements, took, had three bodies of work on there. Um, I had some good reviews and then I had one that just really set me back hard. Like it was downright brutal. Yeah. Um, it's the most brutal review I've ever had still to this day. Um, like he literally looked at two images and threw the iPad back at me and says, you want me to be honest or you want me to sugarcoat it? And I was like, I'm all the way here in Philadelphia. You might as well just give it to me. So I had a 20 minute just rant on the work. <laughs> and it was nothing, criti nothing critical or like that I could write down to like really focus on. You know, so it was just brutal. And then the funny thing was, is like I saw him later that evening at a gallery talk. Um, Heido and uh, Modica, Andrea and Modica, were giving a speech. And uh, he asked me, he's like, hey, you doing okay? You, you all right? Everything good? Your image on the wall looks great. And I was just, I was just floored. And then that, that was really, really, really hard for me. Um, and I had to come back. I came back because I was still in my studies and I came back and I had to really reassess what I was doing. And that's where you start to see kind of a shift from like the weird, creepy conceptual stuff to where I started stripping things down a little more. So that even though that review was really bad, I took the positive out of it and started to really focus on things. And then when I did um, my next review, I think that was in 2012. And then I didn't ever have the courage to go back until 2015. And I took that first work, body of work of Easton out to Fotonola. And that was like smooth selling. It was amazing the night and day difference from being naive, not knowing what I was doing to being prepared from my schooling to say, having a body work I stood behind that was cohesive, having prints, <laughs> yeah. you know? Uh, yeah. So I, I just have taken chances. Um, but I've remained friendly. Even like when I was getting ripped, I still was friendly to the, to the reviewer. Yeah. You know? You know, one thing I've noticed in uh, just knowing you over the past year is it seems like you value the in-person meeting. Whether I do. It, whether it's meeting me when he came to San Francisco or meeting, you know, things like Review Santa Fe where you can sit down and meet someone or the thing you get to go to in Chico. And then w would you want to elaborate on that at all? I just, I mean, we are, live in such a connected world and we can connect with each other through social media, which is, is always a great first stepping stone. But it's just after you really meet these people in person, it's like, I, well, it's just like, I love building relationships with other photographers. It's like, there's a certain mindset and a certain dialogue. We kind of know each other, how each other ticks in ways. Um, Cause we all see the world in a little bit different view like we're always kind of step back a little bit and always kind of watching and watch you know watchful of what's around us and we see things differently and as a stay-at-home dad and a lot of all my friends live throughout the country like good friends that I grew up with you know so it's it's important to me to be able to meet people face to face and connect with them because I just you just build that relationship a little bit further you know and it's, and it's like you know, you bring up Review Santa Fe. I met like Tara White Ray. Um, she did the Too Tired Project and she did something. She did a film way back way called Manhattan, Kansas that got a lot of acclaim awards. And then she moved on to photography and she does some great still life stuff. Um, but she runs this little project called Too, the Too Tired Project. And it's like I met her finally at Review Santa Fe. We had social, you know, social media connections we had a nice conversation and then 
three or four months later, she's like, hey, I want to use your project on my blog. It's like, yeah, go for it. You know what I mean? So it's just like all these little interactions and meetings lead to somewhere. I think you have to build them to keep going forward. Um, and it's just like with, you know, that Timothy and I were just going to have a casual conversation last week. Like, hey, how's it going? How are you doing? And he's like, hey, while we're on the phone, it might be interesting to have you come speak to class. And it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, so it's just like those things, they just happen, you know, and it's today I got an email from like Feature Shoot ran that work with like the house on the head and the keys years ago, like at late 2015. And ever since then, they have remained in contact with me, the editors. Um, and they emailed today, right, right before this, they're like, hey, we're going to do something coming up here on photographers that are going to support Joe Biden. Are you interested? Do you, are you going to support <laughs> Joe Biden? And what? I was like, well, I am curious to hear what you're going to talk about. That's I mean, so he, yeah, I was like, he's not my first choice, but yes, I will support Joe Biden. So, so I don't know where I, like I said, it's just, we have made, remained in contact. Like after I finished my grad degree, they reached out for Fuji. They like, Fuji wants to do a little blog in Australia about parents that shoot their family and they're, they want to ask you some questions. I was like, sure. So it's just like, you know, one time, but I've remained in contact and just kept that, we just kept this dialogue. It's not always constant. You know, I try to reach out to people like my good friend, Daniel Coburn more often. And, you know, amazing, amazing photographer that's kind of just living a isolated life right now. But it's helpful for me to kind of be, it resets me in a way. Um, like, no, everything you're doing is not in vain. You're getting somewhere. Um, and it, it's just, I don't know. I enjoy being in person. And, and I think that because goes to my age, maybe. That's how I was raised. You know, maybe it's an age thing. Yeah, that's really long, super winded. <laughs> well, to me, it seems like you knew the value of an in-person meeting even if there was not a goal to that meeting. That yeah, and yeah, definitely. And that's one thing I've learned, like all those juried exhibitions are great. It's good to get your work out there. Um, but those poor polar reviews have been some of the bigger pivotal moments in my trajectory. Which ones? Um, I, I, I did that one, um, it was called Onward Photo Fest. That was my very first one. It's not around anymore. I haven't heard of that one. Yeah. Yeah, they went bankrupt and they yeah. stole a bunch of prints from people. It was a bad, bad thing. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then I've done Photo Nola, which that is not an expensive one. Mm -hmm. um, I really like that one because it's got a really strong community feeling. Mm -hmm. um, it's simple, like you stay in the hotel, you walk across the street, you go to the conference room. It's really easy, it's laid out really well. Um, that one, everybody was super friendly. You know, you, Aileen Smithson's usually there, Blue Mitchell's usually there. You know, that's a really good one to go to. Um, and then after that, I got into jury, the jury review Santa Fe. Oh yeah. Um, that one was a really good one too, because that's the first time I kind of took a rough edit of the fragility of fatherhood. Mm -hmm. it's not like I've kind of come to a final not really a final edit but a strong edit that I send out to people of like 10 to 12 yeah. um but I took probably I know you're not supposed to but everybody always got through them I took probably 30 prints um out to those I would hit them hard with the ones I knew were solid and I'd be like well this is where I'm at now working on this and some of those prints like that's how I gauged things because some of those working prints were ones that are like I really like this one, you know, and that's kind of, that's how I ended up with the edit I have now was like after going to Chico, which was the next one, which is Chico is by, done by the charcoal book club. It is absolutely amazing. It's more of a retreat. Yeah. But I will be honest. It's crazy expensive. I mean, it's okay. like 3,500. I think it was just to, yeah. for the reviews. And then you have to pay for your room and board or your room. 
boards and wow. the food's included. Yeah, it's crazy expensive, but it's a week long. Yeah. And you're around the photographers and reviewers and bookmakers nonstop. Yeah. So you're around everybody. So like the connections to build with people is outstanding. And you're around them so much so that you'll have a chance to meet with every single person there. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. Um, so that connection there, it was just amazing. Um, but yeah, it's crazy expensive. And I wasn't actually going to do it. My wife forced the hand on that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, but those are, those are the big ones. Uh, NOLA and Review Santa Fe are definitely big ones. I've never been to Photo Loose Studio. I've heard great things. Oh, and I've I was, heard things about that. Yeah. Yeah, and I was st totally stoked on Photo Fest because I'd heard great things. But, um, yeah, I got down there and, you know, the coronavirus hit. And there was worry that somebody might have had it two nights before. Or they had were at first session and they got went home and got super sick. So they like I was already there in the hotel, got up for reviews that morning, went down, they had a meeting, and they're like, We have to cancel. Oh. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's such oh, a it's I mean, someone one of them has reached out for a review. Ashlyn Davis did, but I haven't heard anything from the other ones. Oh. But you know, that's yeah. That's life and those organizations they have you know, they run off of the funds of the people paying for reviews to pay the reviewers because review they don't pay the reviewers but they pay for their flights and room and board so i i don't know what's going to happen but there's a lot of good ones and I, there's so many more out there than what I, you ever realize like those are the big ones yeah um what's the great one and i think it comes around january um the new york times one that one's free to submit um, oh, that one is good. Yeah, yeah, I've heard great things. It's free to submit, but you know, the, the only downfall about that one that I find is like you never know who makes it. Oh. So you don't know what kind of work they're they're looking reviewing. for. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's yeah. problematic. Yeah, but I've heard great yeah. things about it. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, these things do come and disappear, and even as we're talking about them now, I realize like some have been around for a long time, like Review Santa Fe, but then. Like mm -hmm. a lot of these other things. There used to be another one that I used to really like, Look 3, that was sponsored by a lot of National Geographic people. And that was in Charlottesville, Virginia. And there was a time when Charlottesville, Virginia was only thought of because of Look 3. Um, oh, wow. As opposed to Nazis running around the streets and stuff like that. Yeah. So the, um, that one ended though too, you know. So these things kind of come and go. They have little lifespan. Yeah, and I think they're, is Laura Verba from Charlottesville? Because I know she started one too. It's like kind of a retreat review thing. I've heard great things about that, especially if you're more into like alt processing and more conceptual work. That would be a good solid one to go to. Oh, I'm not I don't remember what it's called though. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I keep wondering about Eddie Adams. And we have AAU students. It's like almost every year we have some of our student one or two students get into that one. Have you tried? It's more documentary based, but have you done that one? No, or try I don't know that? about that one actually. Oh, that's yeah. Massive, massive. Yeah, it's a huge Eddie group. Adams. Yeah. Yeah, really for photojournalism. Photo, it's people. like hardcore documentary. Yeah, yeah and, I, and I've submitted the work to a few like documentary type things and grants and and stuff and i i have a hard time with it because the work is not really purely documentary no yeah yeah it's, no it's definitely in the art world hey yeah to kind of bring this around and then we're going to take a break and then we're going to bring you back to look at the students family photography work that they've been awesome with. but can you name some photographers that are like immediate influences that influenced like your work just through your history you know like you mentioned some in your thing like you thought something looked like park harrison and are there other ones yeah and my my influence kind of shift and and wane like yeah. most, especially photographers um as far as like old historical photographers like the, the solid ones gowan is definitely a solid one and that and that's a funny one because i didn't really come be, like become a fan of his work until like the last two years yeah. Um, cause I've always been more into contemporary photography. Um, sick Harvey. I, I, I still love her work. Um, Eleanor Carucci, that last book mother is just astounding. 
Um, Josh Smith is a newer one. He just did a book. Is he's it TW friend. Press? He lives out here. He lives in El Cerrito. <laughs> um, he's, a, he's an instructor out there somewhere. But um, is it, I don't well, know if it's TW Press or what, but he did a book called Sun, yeah. which is really good, which I wish I would have known about that work a long time ago. Um, Gus Powell, that book, um, Family Car Trouble, is just amazing. And that's somebody I never would have been in tune with. Um, my goodness, I, I'm a photo book nut. Like, I, I have stacks. I just love photo books. I had bought, there's a new one coming out with Andrew Modica and Sick Harvey. And it's like, oh, a I saw that. Thing. yeah, I jumped on it right away. Like, I just automatically ordered it. Matt Ike is a, a big oh, one yeah. that I absolutely love. Yeah. Um, I do, I follow his little, I've, I've gotten two of them, like his little zines he puts out on his own. Um, Nathan, oh my goodness, I'm drawing a blank. He's a good friend of Tim. I met him at Chico. Um, he does a lot of pictures of trees. I'm drawing a blank now. Tim, uh, my goodness, I'm drawing a blank. But he is with, oh my goodness. Oh, it's terrible of me. I'm horrible at names. But yeah. I, I, That's I, enough. <laughs> yeah, I, I just keep going. Like, I, I'm always finding somebody new. Brian Schumacher is another one that is. Oh, yeah. I like I love that one book he did, his first book, and then that last book he did a couple of years ago, Good Goddamn. That's amazing. He just got a Guggenheim. I know, I know. He did last just this year. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um. Hey, let's. You he has ties, so like I've emailed. Him. <laughs> the uh, you are a great speaker. What I think we should do is let's take a break, and then my class. What I'd like you to do is we are going to have Troy here to look at your family photography. And because I want to get through everyone, why don't we, because you've had two assignments to photograph family. One was to photograph family, and then the other was to photograph family and get yourself in it as we looked at Troy's work. And so why don't you just pick three, you know, put together a little collection of three images and we'll have Troy go through that work and see what he has to say. Uh, is that cool? And then those who are guests, Deanna, Chris, if you have work you want to show, you have to go last, but you can go, you can, you can show it as well. So, okay, let's take a 10 minute break and uh, we'll all come back here in 10 minutes, okay? All right, thank you. <laughs> 